UN Conference of the Law of the Seas. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor Norris, for making the trip. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do what I usually don't do, is uh, I'm going to uh, read the abstract and the conclusion of a paper that I have written over 80 pages. It takes a lot to refute 500 pages. And uh, at the end of that, then, we'll see if uh, any of you uh, have the courage to ask questions before your exam. <laughs> I have never had a group of students that complained when we stopped early. So I have no objection if uh, I get to go off shopping for my grandchildren. <laughs> okay, um, this, this uh, paper that I have written is on the July 2016 award in the South China Sea uh, case. Uh, you're getting the dissent first, because I know the troops are coming next week that are all going to think it's wonderful. So I'm hopeful that you'll take at least a note or two and and embarrass them by asking them something that uh, probably is an error in, in the case. Uh, for this, uh, I ask that you sort of dog ear Article 121 and Article 298, and you'll see in a minute why. So, um, my uh, opinion is, is basically uh, on the basis of their errors, and uh, I'm going to read you, which I never do, haven't done this in years, but I want to get through what I have written. So I'm going to read this, if you want to go a little bit, that's okay. Um, the 12 July 2016 Arbitration Award on the Merits in the dispute between the Philippines and the People's Republic of China resulted in a problematic victory for the Philippines. The fundamental reason was that the arbitration tribunal erred in its application and interpretation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the definition of what is an island and what is a rock with respect to Itumaba, Taipei. That is the largest island in the uh, Spratlys. By holding that Itu Aba Taiping was a rock, the tribunal determined that the maritime feature was only entitled to a 12 mile territorial sea. Had it been found to be an island, the feature would have been entitled to a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. This EEZ which would have reached almost to the, the coast of the Philippines, would have overlapped with 200-mile EDZ claims of several other nations, Vietnam, one of them, including the Philippines. Pursuant to the 25 August 2016 Chinese Declaration, as provided in Clause Article 298, the overlapping sea boundary disputes bar the tribunal from taking compulsory jurisdiction. So the bottom line in my opening is that the case should never have been taken up in the first place had they properly looked at what was on uh, the Atu Aba Taiping Island. The study that I've done does not analyze all the issues in the 500 page award, but instead focuses on the crucial aspects of an accurate interpretation of the definitional text of Article 121 and its application to Aba Tepin. The goal of this study was to interpret accurately the text in the convention and to confirm its meaning by its context through a comprehensive review of the relevant legislative history of the Third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, conference negotiations with respect to Article 121. 
Uh, I had a co-author in this. Uh, he uh, was willing to do all the donkey work on checking the citations, which made me very happy as an old guy. I don't need another publication, believe me. Um, he, he also happens to have a master's in uh, marine geology, did a lot of work for Woods Hole. But, most pertinent, at the Rhodes Academy, as a student this past summer, he sat in for a two and a half hour session where uh, Wolfram and Cott, the two uh, probably intellectual leaders of the award, were uh, able to explain why they did what they did. And uh, so he, he was present when they explained much of the tribunal's rationale for the award. Needless to say, uh, my opinions and his are, uh, are, are, are only our own personal re recollections and, and uh, conclusions. But we disagree in particular with Article 121.3 as defined in the award. The entire text reads, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. The tribunal observed in the award that the convention classifies features on their natural condition, which is accurate for paragraph 1 of 121, where the word naturally modifies the word form. Uh, in fact, the U.S. in 1958 put that distinction in because they didn't want artificial islands to be treated as, as if they were natural islands. The tribunal erred by erroneously transposing the word natural from 121 into the meaning of 121.3. As elaborated in our study, the actual convention text provides that rocks are subcategories of islands and therefore, of course, must be naturally formed. They didn't need to be that one to death. For the differentiation between rocks and islands, in paragraph 3, However, the text is addressed to the human element, not Mother Nature. The plain meaning of the text in paragraph 3 is evidence. The reference is to sustaining human habitation and human economic life, not some primordial natural formation uh, of, of the island itself. This reading is substantiated in the third conference legislative history context of the negotiation. The tribunal also errs by not identifying the all-important element inherent in the text of when must a feature be naturally formed, or when is a feature's entitlement determined. The award relies on spotty, incomplete historical materials mostly found in Paris or London to evaluate features without even technical acknowledgement that all of the selected historical features are arbitrary. The co-author's opinion is that the only legitimate starting point for determining the time of whether a feature is a rock or an island, it's, it's not at the time of the Big Bang, it's not at the time of Adam and Eve, it's not at the time that Captain Cook sailed around the South Pacific, but in a lawsuit, the time is when the case is filed. In the case at hand, the arbitration proceeding was initiated by the Philippines on 22 January 2013. The correct time element with respect to that issue is what remedy did the Philippines seek on that date. The tribunal erred in part because of relying on faulty treaty interpretation and application process. The tribunal ought to have interpreted the order, the ordinary, excuse me, the ordinary meaning of the text of Article 123 as required by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Once they had determined 
what the ordinary meaning was, was from the text, they then are obligated by that convention to confirm its conclusions, their conclusions, about meaning in a detailed examination of the legislative history of the third conference negotiations with respect to Article 121. This approach would be facilitated <clears throat> as the negotiations uh, in, it revolved around the same text found in the Convention for the Regime of Islands that was before the conference from 1975 to 1982. The exact substantive text was carefully scrutinized and reviewed by delegations, not only with great expertise in Law of the Sea, some 150 minister plenipotentiaries, but the delegates were also properly empowered by their sovereign states to negotiate the language for the draft convention. In our view, the tribunal overstepped its juridical role when it took it upon itself to use legitimate procedural latitude entrusted to it to embark on a wide-ranging historical review of sub, uh, substantive factors with only a marginal relationship to the intended meaning of the convention and little relation to the actual conference negotiation with respect to that article. The tribunal, for example, read into the text dependence upon, and I quote here, A, the objective capacity of a feature, B, in its natural condition to sustain either C, stable community of people, or D, economic activity that is neither dependent on outside resources, nor that is neither dependent on outside resources, nor purely extractive in nature. End quote. I have no idea where that language came from. It's not in the convention. It's not in the legislative history, and we trace the first 25 pages are tracing every single reference that was made for, uh, to the, the article. So in, in our opinion, such discretionary input by the tribunal has no credible support in the text or in the context of the convention. Applying self-inflicted, in, sorry, self-injected criteria, the tribunal inaccurately concluded that none of the Spratly group were islands. So essentially, if, if you're familiar with legal arguments, they put up a straw man, then knocked it down and congratulated themselves on how they had refuted what they set up as a straw man. Uh, such a conclusion was, uh, however, procedurally convenient because it would allow the tribunal to pursue it with it being labeled a rock rather than an island, the tribunal was free to proceed with the case since under that holding there were no overlapping sea, they said there were no overlapping sea boundaries. The first part of this study that we did provides what was lacking in the war of the award, a detailed background and an analysis of the relevant legislative history context for the text of Article 21. The second part of the study consists of what the co-authors believe is an accurate interpretation and application of the Article 121 text to the Atu Aba Taiping Island. The, this part also provides a graphic illustration of the actual overlap of claim of territorial sea claims that occur when applying the tribunal's determination that the various relevant features were rocks, only entitled to a 12 mile uh, nautical mile territorial sea and 25 four mile contiguous zones. In part three, the study delves into supplementary sources to confirm the co-author's interpretation of 121.3 and presents several case studies of unprotested examples 
using the correct interpretation in state practice, which could be called into question were the results of the award to be applied. With respect to the draft conclusion, the award, in our opinion, goes in the wrong direction when it leaves the text of the convention and the tribunal overreached its judicial role by injecting in it elements that are not found in the text, are not obvious from the ordinary meaning of the text, and are nowhere found in the convention legislative history. One easy example to mention is that they spent so much time talking about historic rights. Where is historic rights in the convention? The phrase does not exist in the convention, and that's no oversight. It was a deliberate move in order to leave out something that was unprovable. Un, uh, uh, so the regime of islands text was carefully scrutinized and reviewed at the third conference, as demonstrated in our study. The text that survived intact as first drafted in 1975 was an imperfect com uh, compromise language. There were reasons that it was in the text. The, 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 there were two competing points of view. One, one point of view uh, was that uh, about 50 members of the, of the conference were states, were in favor of the uh, splitting the difference the, way you delimit as provided in the 1958 Territory of Sea and Contiguous Convention, which had very narrow uh, territorial seas in mind, and those that felt they had special circumstances which were uh, to uh, determine the delimitation. And mostly the special circumstances were islands. And uh, so these two parties were at loggerheads for up until the, the very end of the conference because they were in, their, in the two positions that could not be reconciled. They were basically bilateral delimitation. And if any of you have had uh, experience with bilateral delimitations, you know that, that uh, if, you, if you have the one theory that, oh, we should be like Japan and split the difference in the East China Sea with the China, right? Because they got islands out there. Or if you're like the Chinese and so all the sediments that are in there came from the Yellow and, and uh, uh, Yangtze rivers, so you should uh, take that into account uh, when you try to divvy up the oil. Irreconcilable positions. You can't, cannot solve that kind of a problem at a multilateral negotiation with 150 parties. It's, it's something that has to be dealt with by the negotiation of a bilateral agreement. So the tribunal in this case took on political dimensions when it ought to have started with the compromise text in the convention. The tribunal apparently was trying to recover lost ground from the uh, third conference. The reason that I say that is that there was, there was uh, certain states such as Germany, the Netherlands, Poland. Does that start to sound like something? Well, it's three out of five of the members of the, uh, of the tribunal were, are from geographically disadvantaged states. They, the group, not these three people, of course, but the group wanted to restrict the expansive 200 mile claims that came to Pacific Island states. And it, it, it is obvious that one of them ought to be the United States that had Johnston Island that uh, isolated out in the mid Pacific, you arc a 200 mile zone around, and the EEZ is bigger than the state of California. Well, I don't happen to personally think that's equitable. But it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the conference agreed upon. And what they agreed upon 
was that there would be a compromise. They would, for the small island states, they would allow them to have these 200 mile zones and it, it didn't make the geographically disadvantaged states very happy because they have nothing to gain from that. And landlocked states. The group was actually large. And by the way, led by Tommy Coe at that time throughout most of the negoti negotiation. It was interesting because at the end, uh, when they uh, were trying to figure out what to do about the limitations, the way it worked is that they had uh, originally taken the main frames, supposedly, from the Caracas session, and then from the 1975 session, they were to extract the single negotiating text and so, if you look at what they put forward at the end of the uh, 1974 session in the main trance, they had two proposals in there that weren't even in the record from the OAU, and a third one from Romania that had the words in it, but not the meaning in it, uh, with respect to human habitation and economic life of its own. So they. Uh, the, what happened is that uh, the rapporteur of the second committee, who was Satya Nandan, from where an island state with solidarity with the Pacific island states, right? So he also, as we explained in our paper, he had uh, island issues to resolve. Uh, one, one was really a rock, and the other was where they, had to, they couldn't give up sovereignty over it. And the other was a uh, uh, very uh, oh, beyond 200 mile zone uh, island. And so he, and who was his partner from the, the, the Secretariat? Munder Erickson. Where is he from? An island state, right? Okay, so you can see by the, uh, the imperfect language and it certainly is imperfect language. But at a multilateral conference, you often have to get str strategic, deliberate ambiguity, or you don't have a consensus conference. Now that's what the judges apparently didn't understand at all. Uh, because they, they certainly seized on saying, this is a rock and therefore it can't have any EEZ because if there were an EEZ, it would overlap with the claims of, of Vietnam and China and Taiwan. And uh, therefore, we would not have jurisdiction under Article 298 because the Chinese uh, did, and, and I can assure you the United States would, that the, the, there were those that wanted compulsory dispute settlement for everything and those, like Russia, that didn't want for anything. And so they came up with a compromise, and the compromise is, okay, on kind of the little stuff, the, uh, the compulsory jurisdiction will apply. But on boundary delimitations, which deal with the sovereign territory issues, these are big deals to every country, and very few countries when put to it, would prefer to have a five European judges decide for them. And then there were those, like Russia, and frankly, by some of the other nations, such as the United States, that had global maritime uh, needs, uh, that did not want them to decide on military operations. So that was the second category. The third was that there was such a momentum at the conference for coastal states to have all the powers over the resources in the EEZ. Coastal states got nervous and they said, well, we also don't want them to have jurisdiction, compulsory jurisdiction, over law enforcement activities with respect to the natural resources in the EEZ. So those three things are in, you can read it, you don't have to take my word for it, but read it. It's in Article 298. And if, if you make a declaration, as the Chinese did, you're not supposed to have compulsory jurisdiction for it. So I think the court overreached. I think it went into the realm of trying to second guess and, and inject 
its own honestly held views. I, I want to emphasize that because I am a very good friend of all the members of the tribunal and uh, I, I make things as a dissenter in the opinion and not as a, someone that's charging them with improper activities. But I think they're wrong and I've tried to explain the reasons. Uh, what do I hope? Well, I hope that the convention text is found in the uh, convention itself will be interpreted and applied in state practice as intended. Uh, I, I hope that future dispute settle effort, the settlement, dispute settlement efforts will treat the award as just bad precedent. Uh, the Chinese have made it clear from the beginning. They said, we're not going to play. Uh, we made a declaration that uh, this thing is about dispute settlement in sovereign areas uh, and, uh, and overlapping areas. And uh, we're not going to honor this decision because you shouldn't have taken the case. Well, the, uh, the tribunal then looked at what the Chinese had been putting out in their, uh, in their press releases uh, because of, this thing was fought out in the press and the Chinese lost miserably. The, uh, the, they said, hey, we're putting out these positions, but they aren't to be taken as in accepting jurisdiction. And of course, the, uh, the tribunal exercised exercising the powers that it had on procedure, said, oh, we get to decide in the jurisdiction, and in their fourth procedural order, they said, we're going to take the positions that China has put out, and we're going to treat it as if they were a party. Well, maybe that's procedurally fair in your mind. I don't think it is in mine. Uh, and there's a larger question, and that is that the rule of law has only meaning if it's honored. And when you have a state that says, I don't accept this jurisdiction, I'm not going to do it, I don't see how it builds respect for the rule of law. I, I, I will ask you right now, what, what did the, you've got people here from the Philippines, what did the Philippines gain from this initiation? Particularly now they have a new president. And he is playing... He's going to use this thing to some. He's going to get a harbor or something uh, in exchange for the Chinese. You know, they'll make a deal. I bet. Maybe I'm wrong, but the point of it is that that it was a very political award, and now we have a saying: if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And I think they're now faced with the, uh, the political reality that the, the, the government has changed. In Philippines, and uh, I don't know, perhaps he doesn't either, what the new president of the Philippines is going to do. But one thing I am sure about is that the Chinese are not going to back down. Everything that has happened since this case was thrown in in 2015 has been where they have been hardening their position. The, the, the hardliners in China are saying, well, let's go build these things. Uh, we'll call them civilian constructions, but, you know, they're airstrips, and they can have dual use, clearly. So, they haven't uh, been intimidated by this. I think it's uh, like a beast thing. I mean, they're mad as hell about it. And so, I think that's bad, and it's coupled with the fact that in the Arctic Sunrise case, the case that was just before the tribunal, uh, the, the Russians are mad as hell at them. They didn't want to play either. And now I can tell you that having spent time in the United States Senate as a general counsel for a conservative senator, I think this greatly uh, complicates the ability to bring the United States in. Now they say, we don't care, we'll enforce this with the Dutch Navy or something, but that's not the case. It, it, you, you can't afford, when you've got a UN charter that gives enforcement powers to the Security Council, to have three of them that are mad at you. Uh, you can say it doesn't matter, all countries are the same, but they're not. And they aren't provided as the same under the UN Charter either. So 
Uh, I think this is a bad decision. I think it's a bad precedent. I think when you have about uh, an area twice the size of the Louisiana Purchase in the Pacific that would otherwise appertain to the United States from these islands, I think that uh, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to get the U.S. Senate to proceed. There is one little ray of hope, and that is that the, the uh, I think it's Article 294, or 296 maybe, but anyway, it says that, that these kind of decisions are only applicable between the parties. That's standard international law, usually honored more in the breach than in the observance. But nevertheless, there is a, a, a perfectly uh, defensible argument that this case only applies between the Philippines and China, and China says it doesn't apply to us anyway. So I'm sure in our efforts to try to, some of us would really like to say the United States to be a party to this. And we will try to deal with these people in the Senate that don't like it because it involves the United Nations mainly, uh, and persuade them that this this award can be ignored because it really doesn't apply to the United States. No one has protested these claims. Uh, uh, in our study, we, we pull out uh, islands that are in uh, Kiribati, where they've been collecting, uh, you know, from Google Island, they've been collecting money for tuna fishing. Uh, in the United States, the Johnston Island one, which started out with 47 uh, naturally formed acres and now we've dredged it all up and stuff and put airstrip on it and one thing or another and so it's, it's uh, a couple thousand acres. And then in Mexico where uh, we have a, a real Mexican uh, scholar on this in the room and, and uh, she'll uh, verify that they, about a third of their uh, ocean entitlement comes from a couple of isolated rocks. And then Brazil has has one out in the middle. And I, I, there are a lot of them. But the point of it is none of them have been protested on the basis that they are rocks instead of islands. The, one, the, 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 the piece of territory at issue, the president of the, of the uh, Taiwan, it's under Taiwanese control, has been for 60 years. Uh, on, in January of this year, went out there and uh, said, well, you know, I got a couple hundred people here I'm talking to. Uh, we have a harbor, we have an airstrip, we have a hospital, two doctors, a dentist, three nurses. Uh, we've got a shrine, we've got uh, water sailing, desalination. Uh, you know, they're loping along. Well, uh, that was just totally ignored by the, the court. And I, I think it was solely for procedural reasons. They wanted their hands on this case. Now, as far as I can tell, the only real winners are the, the, the lawyers who got seven and a half million dollars from the Philippines, and probably more than double that uh, that the Philippines paid to the Permanent Court of Arbitration because the Chinese weren't gonna give them any money. So they were getting $550 an hour for combing through the archives in the European capitals. Nobody was combing through the archives in China. So I, I think it's a very bad decision. And I'm not mad at anybody, but I, I think that it will certainly make it difficult for the, the U.S. to come on board now. Okay, so it's a quarter up. I'll be quiet. I've gotten through what I had in principle to say. Uh, now, there probably will be questions. Yeah, you, I would like to know your opinion in relation to the business state and the non-appearance non of China during the proceedings and discredit the whole compulsory jurisdiction uh, of the convention. Well, they, they didn't come in because they, in my opinion, had already told the world that for a dispute like this, and that was what was agreed at the conference, in my opinion, that we're not going to submit to compulsory jurisdiction. So, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm hardly a friend of China, but the point it is, what I think personally, points what's in the text. And these texts 
if they had understood the way negotiations go, if you, if you reach an impasse and you're trying to figure out how to move forward, you then get a higher degree of ambiguity, not by accident, but because both sides can say, well, all right, and that, that's exactly what happened here. I don't know, was that, is that responsive to you? No, I think in about the future, if, uh -huh. if in the future the whole system will be like discredited because of this decision. I won't go that far, but I, I, I don't think that we should all uh, link hands and, and, and say how wonderful it is that these people overstep the judicial. I, I, I am a strong proponent, have been for 40 years of the convention, and I, I think even now, with this defect, I'll argue to my own government that they should become a party. But I, I think it's also incumbent on the, those that are empowered to... Uh, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> tell me to stop? <laughs> All right, well, anyway, uh, I, 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 I think it's bad for the rule of law when you don't follow the law. And you inject your personal opinions, basically because you're from a geographically disadvantaged country. Let's see. Okay, lady next. She took a guy with there. Yeah, you. Yeah. I have a small question about the interpretation of the term of their own.
I, I think I was at the negotiations long enough to, to hear the arguments that were made on behalf of the Pacific Islanders and the half of the geographically disadvantaged states that there, there was deliberate ambiguity. That in, the, in the award, they do all this talking about water. Well, tell me where water is as a factor in the convention. It isn't there. And go through the legislative history of all the comments that were made for, for six or seven years on Article 121. Nobody mentioned water. But yet they said, ah, there's not indigenous water. It's uh, not drinkable. Well, you know, I, I, I think they, they created their straw man. And then they whacked it down. And then they said, how beautiful are we? And uh, I, I, I just don't agree. Anyway, I, I don't think you can. I think you've got to look at each individual feature. And, and you can't look at it as a, a group of islands. That's for our departments. Please. Uh, the, the saying is that from the cases of international tribunals, such as the case of Lima and Bangladesh, there's an international tribunal policy to constrain a small island to have, uh, to own or to have. Uh, Were the parties agreeable to be before the tribunal? Both consented to the, the jurisdiction of the tribunal. What I mean is you have to train to consume a small island to have a large marine area. I don't know what the trend is. <coughs> you, you don't know what it is. You know, from the national I, 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 Look, just because they say something doesn't make it true. <laughs> just because you call it a trend, a trend for what? 2013, when the case was filed? Okay, that's what you want to call it a trend from there. Yeah. Okay, well, we got one case since then. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, some more questions. I'm keeping you from your exam. <laughs> one. No more questions. That's great. I'm happy. You're either, you're either mad at me or you are, are uh, going to save all your, your uh, questions for the, the group. Uh, you have Fred Soons coming. He was sitting on the tribunal. You'll find he won't tell you anything. And then you got uh, uh, Clyde, Clyde uh, what's his last name? Schofield. 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 Yeah. Who is, was one of the technical experts, one of the independent experts paid for by the Philippines. <laughs> so, but he's a straight shooter, and, and uh, I'm sure I asked him. I don't mean to talk out of school, but when I was at a, the Naval War College, I said, well, Clyde, did they arc a 200-mile zone from uh, uh, Ituaba? Did they ask you to draw one? He said, no. And he said, I said, my gosh, <laughs> that's the whole case hinges on whether or not they have jurisdiction. And they aren't even looking at the possibility that it's an island with all that stuff on it. There, there are some other issues in, in the case, and so I have to, you know, stop. But uh, anyway, can I ask you just, Myron, just uh, very briefly? So, so in sum, you're saying that if Ituaba is a 121 island, yeah, entitled to the 200-mile zone, that there's maritime boundary issues, and therefore it would have been. <coughs> well, they, they, they themselves say if there's overlapping boundary issues. Uh, overlapping claims. That's, they that's, can't have jurisdiction. That's the main part of what you're. That that's the biggest the, part of what you're saying is that the jurisdiction is slowed down. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. And I think they overstepped their judicial limits. Um, I thought they did it in the Arctic Sunrise case too, as did the Russians. So for, for, for those 298, I know you guys have lunch in the exam, but so just briefly though, for those 298 things, then. Uh, you don't think that a state has to specifically invoke them. You think that it's up to the whatever tribunal uh, or dispute resolution to, to recognize the, the declaration. They, they, they have the procedural right when the state doesn't come before the tribunal to decide whether they have jurisdiction. But I don't think that's unlimited latitude. You think that they, they would still have to look at the declaration of the state and then say, oh, the state accepted out maritime boundaries, therefore we shouldn't touch this? 
they, they, they talk about 298 like they read it carefully and understood it. <laughs> but they didn't apply it. And I think it's because they were happy to get the case. They were <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, we, we have to go on with the idea that that's a precedent for some purposes. And in 501 pages, they should have been able to get it out. I mean, I was reminded of, of the, the novel David Copperfield, written by Charles Dixon Wilkinson. His publisher paid him by the page. <laughs> 500 pages, can you imagine? Oh, I talked too long. I got another question. Okay, sorry. So this is a scientist asking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you, you, can so if you leave? believe in the law of the sea, you signed on to these accords, you believe in the tribunal, the rejection, where do we go? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, for 100% sure, if the U.S. ever gets a session, and they're, 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 it's kind of terrible timing because about the best chance we have is with Hillary Clinton. And I, I, I am a Republican, but I... <laughs> uh, and, and, and so if we were to become a party, we would do exactly the same thing as the Chinese. We would say we don't want the compulsory jurisdiction for boundaries. We don't want the compulsory jurisdiction for military activities. And by the way, the, when they were faced with quasi-military activities in this court, they backed away because they knew <coughs> that there were a lot of states that you know don't 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 want a, a small tribunal like this telling a nuclear carrier task force when it can go through the Indonesian archipelago. It, it just isn't in the reality of the world. You may think it's better if they can, but uh, in, in truth, that's not what's in the convention. So, the, where do we go? I think what I go, I, I go up on the hill, and I spent five years working for a conservative senator in charge of appropriations on foreign ops, so I'm not as naive as some. I, and I say, still on balance. We should discredit this award, and the United States should become a party. Because we, if you want to be political about it, we are the main uh, counterweight to excessive influence by China, which is what a lot of people are worried about. I'm not as worried about that as a lot of other people are. But it sure isn't going to be the Ghanaian Navy. It isn't going to be, you know, the the teeny little places that don't have any, some of them don't even have posters. So, where do we go? I think we go forward and make the arguments. You know a lot about this case. Do you have any comment? I really would value what you said. Yeah. Okay, well, I will try to say something about it. Um, I also disagree on the way um, the tribunal found it had, it had jurisdiction. Uh, but the main issue I was treating was uh, the way they treated also this um, Article 121 and the Article 13 as well, and which deals with low tide elevations. And I really thought, uh, because I heard one of the representatives of China at the tribunal during this celebration of the 20th anniversary, and he said uh, that China also disagree on the point that when you are qualifying an, a feature, a maritime feature, either as an island or as a low tide elevation, you're also saying what is capable and what is not capable of appropriation. So in a way, it's also related to sovereignty, because you are saying what can be appropriated by sovereignty and what cannot. So that's, a, that's also a good point, I think. I think it is, and, and I'll just add that the, the, the Chinese in their territorial sea uh, decree, which was in, I don't know, what, what year? 92 or something, let's say. Uh, and then subsequently in their EEZ proclamations, they specifically claimed ought to up. Specifically. So to say that there was no Chinese claim there, it, it, it's saying, oh, we'll take what the Chinese say in this context, but if it doesn't serve our end, we aren't going to do it in another. I, I, I just think that they. they there are just a lot of inconsistencies in the application of uh, 
the, 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 the convention. Yeah, and especially when they analyze also their travaux préparatoires, uh, because uh, there is no other way to, to uh, make an interpretation of this uh, article. And I, I was also, uh, because the International Court of Justice, uh, at some point in the Nicaragua-Colombia case, they said that this article was customary international law. And if you ask some judges, they will say, yes, I don't have a problem with, with that. Yeah, it's customary international law, because you can have... Uh, as part of this convention, almost the whole international community. But then I say, you can say that for every one of the provisions. You can almost. say a lot of stuff. Exactly, and I mean, from my research, I found that the only, the only, <laughs> the only country that adopts the, the definition of the Article 121, it's Mexico. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and the, the only one country that we from Mexico. <laughs> Uh, and the only country that uh, withdraw, uh, I mean, withdraw the, the claim uh, of, of an island co um, concerning a rock hole was the UK in 1995. So, and then the rest of the states, they will always claim a, a maritime feature as an island. They, I, I will not claim as a long tail elevation because I want to have also exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. But this is only a unilateral act of the state. But then you have to see if this unilateral declaration, uh, unilateral act, is uh, in conformity or not with international law, which is the most important. Comment? Do you have, do you have words for the rest? Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. Uh, talking. yeah. Sorry. I was explaining to you about customary international law. This is not a. Well, probably they need it for the exam. Come on, tell me. <laughs> Any, any other comments, or we can then go study it for the exam. How's that? Okay, or am I done, James? No, I'm done. All right, thank you.